Yeah, so on to after our big summarizing, uh, 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 you know, task yesterday, uh, today we'll do um, lesson four, a uh, unit three, lesson four, back to compare and contrast. Um, but again, I think that's going to be uh, useful on two sides, right? Because just th that extra practice will help us and we'll get some more, we're moving uh, back into more history. Like we recover the civics in the in the first few lessons there, we're going to start uh, revisiting like uh, the era of reconstruction, things like that during uh, the lesson today. So let's pop open unit three, lesson four. And just like our other compare and contrast. Well, let's see if it actually opens all the way for me here. Sometimes they don't want to provide everything. Let me back out of it and try it again. Okay, lesson four. There it is. Okay, so uh, for our lesson today, by the time we complete this one, you'll be able to compare items by considering similarities and differences, uh, contrast items by focusing on differences, and then compare and contrast to gain a deeper understanding of materials read. Um, and you know, we've encountered several times, and if nothing else, it's more practice for us. So let's check our audio here. <laughs> when you compare two or more items, you consider the similarities between them. The study of history, geography, civics, government, and other social studies subjects often requires you to compare details about people, places, and events. To contrast means to focus only on the differences between items. By focusing on the ways in which things are alike and how they are different, you gain a deeper understanding of the material you read. As with other areas of the GED test, questions about comparing and contrasting will test your ability to interpret information at various depth of knowledge levels through the use of complex reading skills and thinking skills. Yep, this is uh, as we've already encountered, you know, comparing uh, two or more items is to consider their similarities, right? Things in which they're alike and to con contrast is the exact opposite where we're, you know, um, considering what makes them different. And yeah, so uh, what we have here, our text here about Lincoln and uh, the uh, Reconstruction, which is going to be a, a, a major theme for the lesson today. So as the Civil War came to a close, President Abraham Lincoln began to consider how the United States should be rebuilt. His plan for reconstructing the South called for generous terms that would allow the nation to heal with as little animosity as possible between the North and the South. On the other hand, the radical Republicans in Congress strongly opposed his plan. They believed that the Confederacy should receive harsh penalties for the difficulties of the Civil War. Um, and radical Republican meant something completely different at this time. Um, the party was more progressive. And like it says here, you know, they really wanted to come down on the South and punish them. Lincoln, you know, was wanting to reach out um, and, and, you know, extend the olive branch, you know, and, and try to reconcile our differences. Uh, so it says, uh, when it says uh, in our text box that, hey, uh, you may find information to compare and contrast in both uh, text and visuals, such as tables, charts, and graphs. You may assume that most parallel items, such as two belief systems described in text uh, or visual can be compared and contrasted. So, you know, when they say parallel, uh, just like in math, parallel lines, so the things that kind of run uh, congruent to each other. All right, and our next text box, B, uh, it says words and phrases such as similarly, likewise, on the other hand, and however, often signal that an author is comparing or contrasting information. So um, I put up a, I think a few, I, I think I put up a Venn diagram that shows comparing and contrasting words the other day. Um, so, you know, you could, you can always look for those comparisons and, and contrasting elements through the signal words that we see. 
Okay, so we'll move into the quiz, compare and contrast quiz on lesson four, unit three. Okay. Just like always, we start with the same text talking about President Abraham Lincoln and his intent on how he planned to um, reconcile with the South. And our text here says making assumptions. So the text on this page compares and contrasts reconstruction plans, of President Lincoln and the radical Republicans. Be sure that the items you compare and contrast relate in a similar way. So, you know, we, we can zone in right on, on what we're comparing and contrasting. Lincoln and the more radical, uh, I don't want to say necessarily extremist, because um, that has a different connotation in, in today's world, but they were uh, very much uh, wanting to punish the South uh, for uh, the war and um, not necessarily, you know, we're going to see as we go along here, some of the ideas that were involved in that. Um, let's see, uh, Etta, you want to read question one for us? Okay, when comparing or contrasting the plans of President Lincoln and the radical Republicans, which mm -hmm. of the following statement is accurate? A, they both aim to rebuild the nation as quickly as possible. B, both plans impose similarly harsh penalties on the Confederacy. C, they feature different objectives for bringing the nation together. Or D, the two plans delegated much of the responsibility for reconstruction to state governments. Um, C? Yeah, different strategies, right? Different objectives. For bringing the nation together somehow i don't know considering you know where we're at in 2021 the radical republicans may have had an idea there um but you know as far as bringing the nation together lincoln is looking more at a, a you know less harsh exactly right it's less harsh um and you know at the time i'm sure it, it seemed that way um you know, what inevitably happened, and we're going to read a little bit about this too, is that those memories didn't really die. And instead of like the South really thinking, oh, shucks, we messed up, you know, this was, you know, this was on us. Um, this idea called the noble, or no, I'm sorry, the lost cause developed. And it's a strand that you still hear about today that uh, the Confederate effort uh, was noble and just and that they were fighting for states rights and uh that was you know started gaining traction in the 1870s and then we get into the early 1900s you know the statues of uh lee and stonewall jackson and jefferson davis and all these people start going up and they were smoothing out that that memory of what really happened um and that's you know how we're kind of why this is still an issue today because, you know, in, in one hand, was it, you know, better to, you know, have a less harsh um, interaction between the North and the South to bring them back into the fold uh, or, you know, you know, hindsight being 2020, maybe the radical Republicans were right. We need to really bring the hammer down on them to squash those ideas and, uh, you know, not be where we are today. It's hard to say, it's hard to say what, well, you know, if that would have played out better or not. Um, so yeah, one is C is in cat. And we have a new text here. Uh, we'll swap out a little bit here because that's quite a lot of reading. Uh, Tracy, would you like to read the first paragraph for us, please? Yes. Few time in the history of the United States were more um, tumultuous, tumultuous than the dozen years follow the Civil War, the period known as Reconstruction. The reason for this uh, obvious in retrospect, some people wanted the South to pay for its actions. They had a punitive attitude Others, however, wanted a gender healing hand to resume it to resume it the country. The new resident 
Andrew Johnson uh, is same like family fried. This later group, President Johnson supported the view of the recently assassinated Abraham Lincoln. All right. Yeah. And so Andrew Johnson was uh, Lincoln's vice president when uh, Lincoln is assassinated. Of course, he right. We've talked about order of succession. So as vice president, he took over and he had that same attitude, basically, that Lincoln held. Um, Grace, you want to read the second paragraph for us? Yeah. A group of politicians called the Radical Republicans wanted to give full rights to recently freed enslaved people, that's free men. Whereas much of the South remained committed to preserving its social and economic way of life. The Radical Republicans disapproved of President Johnson's lenient approach. Eventually, they impeached him. Their actions the actions fell just one senatorial no, sanitary vote short of having President Johnson removed from office. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, senatorial vote. Good job there. Uh, yeah, he was impeached, uh, and that's how close his that they almost removed him, and that was over the idea of Reconstruction. Um, so, you know. Uh, we, we you know encountered impeachment a few, a few times in more recent history and this one was really about it was very much policy driven you know it wasn't about the character of the the man or you know a crime or something that they were you know maybe you know committed uh this was it was it was oriented towards you know his decisions and how he thought of things as opposed to the radical republicans um capri you want to take the next paragraph for us Sure. The war devastated the South with cities such as Atlanta, Georgia, and Columbia. South Carolina burned to the ground. A significant percentage of Southern men had been killed or wounded in the war, straining the South's ability to rebuild itself. It would take years to restore the cities and repair the damage to the industry and economic and economy. And these desperate needs created opportunities for extraordinary profits and exploitation of those weaker by the war. Northerners moved, moving to the South to take advantage of these opportunities were known as carpetbaggers, owing to the type of luggage they carried. Protection against such exploitations were not nearly so numerous or effective as they are today. Yeah, and so this is one you know thing that uh, Lincoln and Johnson had to take into account is the, just the utter destruction of the in the South, uh, the loss of a a labor force because of you know there was uh, at that time uh, you're in 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 both uh, the Union and the Confederate armies the units were organized around their, you know, their hometowns or their home county or something, when you went, you enlisted, you would be in a unit with, you know, your brother or your friends, you know, they're all together. Well, you go into a big battle and it wipes out that unit uh, or decimates it. And you don't have anybody returning for, you know, to the workforce. You don't have, you know, uh, population becomes an issue because you can't repopulate, you know, because your, your, your husbands didn't come home. Um, so th that was an issue. Um, and we learned that later on and we realized that we can't, you know, in, in later wars that we can't have, you know, a whole unit that's, that, that comes from, you know, Dublin, Ohio, because that's going to affect population down the road. So that was an issue. And then you have, uh, you know, economic trouble. And then you have Northerners, these carpetbaggers that are actually taking advantage of it as they, as they come to the South. Um, and then the final what, uh, two more paragraphs. Uh, so, Christiana, can you read the next one? Um, did you say Christiana? Uh, can you call me? Yeah, yeah. Can you can you read the the next paragraph? Oh, okay. Uh, a serious economic depression in the United States in 1873, 
significantly, is it, um, ha, I'm just going to that word. Hampered. Okay, hampered the result of the more economically powerful not to provide re reconstruction assistance to the uh. South. The former Northern General uh, uh, <laughs> Ulysses. <laughs> Ulysses Grant was president at that time. He withdraw he withdraw the mm. troops protecting the South from various abuse, leaving mm. Southerners to fed from for themselves. The situation led to the rise of powerful Southern political and economic interests, including radical groups such as the Kud. Uh, please, the K word. Yeah, Ku Klux Klan, everyone's favorite, the KKK. <laughs> the, the Ku Klux Klan. The South became a radically divided society, which continued until the civil rights movement of the 1960s. All right. And I'll just finish off here. Reconstruction was a critical time for the United States. The decisions made and actions taken at the time have had lasting effects. As a result, this post-war period presents ample opportunities for comparing and, and contrasting. Um, yeah, so uh, eventually, you know, we, we, we hit an economic downturn in the 1870s. And, you know, we had um, soldiers stationed around the South. We, the North was very involved with, um, bring, uh, you know, trying to rebuild and everything, but with the economic downturn, the the federal government couldn't continue its investment and couldn't keep a close eye on the South. Uh, and we're, we'll see in some of the other later uh, uh, readings and stuff how that turn, plays out, but they were kind of left to their own devices at that point. So we'll see, like when we get to the 13th, or the, yeah, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, what that means uh, for a lot of people. Um, so I'll go ahead and read the question too here. So whose interests appear to be most aligned? A, radical Republicans and Freedmen, B, Andrew Johnson and the radical Republicans, C, Freedmen and the Carpetbaggers, or D, President Grant and Freedmen? Is it the A? Yes, A, radical Republicans and Freedmen. So the radical Republicans, right, are, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to, to keep an eye or, or they're trying to help out, you know, the recently freed slave population. So, of course, they're going to, uh, their, their ideas align a little closer there. Uh, and our next question, uh, Etta, you want to read question three for us? Whose interests? appear to differ most a carpetbaggers and freedmen b radical republicans and president johnson <clears throat> c northerners in general and president grant or d president johnson and president lincoln mm -hmm. b B, yeah, B is in boy, right? Radical Republicans and President Johnson <clears throat> were not on the same page. So they differ the most there. Some of these groups really wouldn't have a lot. Carpetbaggers and freedmen, uh, not, not a lot of interaction between the two. I mean, they would have been associated because of the carpetbaggers moving to work in the South. Northerners, uh, a lot of times they were indifferent. Uh, you know, they were, you know, sort of, interested in, in, in their own world. Um, they were certainly, you know, glad to see the end of the war. They were glad to see, uh, you know, uh, the, the North win and, 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 and the slaves freed. Um, Grant, that, that's, yeah, it's just not really lining up there. And we haven't really discussed Grant. He comes a little bit later, except for, you know, at the end here. So moving on to question four. Uh, Tracy, would you like to read question four? 
for us. Yes. Which of the following can be substituted for result in order to provide the most accurate interpretation of the text? A, a stamp. B, solution. D, determination. D, hesitation. Result, uh, solution. B. In, 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 this, in this context, it's C, determination. Solution is another, um, you know, definition. Um, and, but in, in this case, we have to look at the context. I'm trying to, where do we encounter that? Let's see. Right here. Oh yeah, it's, of course, it's, it's, it's uh, in boldface. So a serious economic depression in the United States in 1873 significantly hampered the resolve of the more economically powerful North to provide reconstruction assistance to the South. So that's one you'd have to go back and, and take a look at. Hopefully, you know, if you if you can count that on a test, they'll actually have a bold faced as well. So, you know, what we're talking about here is their, their determination to keep uh, continuing with the reconstruction of the South. So kind of have to use those context clues there. Uh, Grace, would you like to read question five for us? Okay. Oh, wait, we have another. All right, I'll go ahead and read the passage real quick here. All right. Uh, okay. In June 1863, Confederate General Robert E. Lee led his troops into Pennsylvania. We've actually already read this. We, we've seen this before. Uh, with the aim of capturing the railroad hub at Harrisburg. While marching through Pennsylvania, Lee forbade his troops from looting farms or destroying homes. Instead, his troops paid for the food that they took with useless Confederate money. Uh, in May, G, thanks for your Confederate dollar. Uh, in May 1864, Union General William T. Sherman began his march through Georgia. Sherman encouraged his men to take food and livestock from the farms they passed. So we, we've talked about that before. I think we saw that exact text box uh, in, in past time here. Uh, but uh, uh, Grace, you want to go ahead and read the question for us? No, okay. In which of the following ways were the actions of both generals similar? A. Both required troops to take loyalty. B. Both ordered troops to take over railroad lines. C. Both had troops collect supplies, supplies from local people. And D. Both assigned troops to build roads. C. Yep, C, right? They both had the troops collect supplies from local people. So five is C. And, uh, you know, it, 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 truthfully, you know, Robert Lee was, was, you know, acting like he was chivalrous by giving them Confederate money that they couldn't spend anywhere in the North. It was just as useless, as, you know, so he really, you know, it, it was a gesture of goodwill and he was trying to, you know, act gentlemanly, but it really was still taking from, you know, the, the people of the North, you know, when he was trying to supply his army, his army on his way to Gettysburg. Uh, Sherman did no pretenses with Sherman. Uh, he was, he was about taking stuff from the South. He's, he, this is, you know, that's what made him a much better general. He understood modern war more than Lee. He knew that you're going to have to come down on the entire population. He looked at the entire population as a as a war making uh, uh, machine, you know, industry. You know, this, this, this was the beginning of, of an idea of total war and modern warfare, where the people were also a mechanism in war making uh, because of the great demand on supplies and, and machinery uh, that and manufacturing. So he was willing to and, 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 and uh, morale. You know, if you if you take the, the morale away from the people, then then you're you're going to use your will to fight. And he understood that a lot better than Lee did. Um, so five of C. That's the last question for the quiz. Uh, running through our questions here real quick. One was C is in cat. Two was A. 
Three was B as in boy. Four, C as in cat. And five was C as in cat. So everybody caught up there. All right, we will move on to the workbook. <clears throat> and again, same ideas here, preparing, uh, learning yourself with what's similar, contrasting is concerning yourself with what is different. So we'll pop into the workbook. Okay. And this is um, from, I think the title is actually the, it's, 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 it's a huge long title, but it is like the South Carolina's Declaration of Immediate Causes. Um, and so I'll, I'll read it here real quick. We'll see what we're talking about. Um, from South Carolina's Ordinance of Secession. We, the people of the state of South Carolina, in convention assembled, do declare and ordain that the ordinance adopted by us in convention, whereby the Constitution of the United States of America was ratified, and also all acts and parts of acts of the General Assembly of this state ratifying amendments of the said Constitution are hereby repealed. That's the operative part there, really. And the union now <laughs> subsisting between South Carolina and other states under the name of the United States of America is hereby dissolved. So, you know, this is their declaration where they are seceding <laughs> from the United States. They are no longer going to be a part of the United States. This is the official document detailing that. The second part here uh, from South Carolina's Declaration of Immediate Causes says, the state of South Carolina having resumed her separate and equal place among nations deems it's due to herself to the remaining United States of America and to the nations of the world that she should declare the immediate causes which have led to this act. So it's, you know, a lot like the Declaration of Independence, right? This is, this is a declaration of their uh, seceding from the South. And that second part is basically saying that we are going to be viewed equally among nations, right? No longer a part of the United States. Um, so in A, uh, it, it's just mentioning the titles, right? So the titles of passages like these tell you what information will be covered. These titles can prove hints to similarities and differences that you may find within the passage. Uh, and this comes from the same document, but they, they do outline kind of certain details within that. And then uh, B says, consider the purpose that the author or authors had for writing these passages. How are their goals for writing similar and how are they different? I kind of think it's awkward that they're using the same document here, like the same piece, but there are different parts to it and they, they have uh, a different meaning. And then our test taking tip says, when answering a compare and contrast question on a test, look closely at the main ideas of each passage or graphic. Ask yourself how those main ideas are similar or different. Okay. Always asking yourself those questions. So, um, Capri, you want to read question one for us? What do the following... Which of the following do both of these passages address? South Carolina succession from the United States, disputes between Northern and Southern states, slavery in the United States, or South Carolina's place among world nations? The answer is A. Yeah, A, right? South Carolina's secession from the United States. That's pretty clear in both, right? In both passages. All right, and number two, um, Etta, would you like to take number two for us? Okay, it says, <clears throat> which of the following features of these experts is most different? A, writing style, B, purpose, C, time period, or D, subject matter? Subject matter? It's, uh, it's close, B is uh, the purpose. So the subject matter is, 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 is similar, right? It's all about secession and why they're seceding. 
uh, the purpose is a little bit different as far as what they're outlining. So the first part is, is basically telling the United States, hey, we're peacing out. We're not going to be part of the United States anymore. And then the second one is addressing more of the world and, you know, saying that we are South Carolina and we want to be recognized among the, the world's nations. Uh, so that's the, the, the bit of the difference there. All right. So to be as in boy. Um, and let's see some more reading. Tracy, would you like to read the first paragraph for us? Yes. An agricultural system known as scrapping emerged in the south at the end of the server sower. Planters hire many formerly enslaved people to work specific areas of plantation, plantations, cultivating crops such as cotton. These workers came to Southern France with their families and provided the labor planters required to continue producing crops. The planters provided nearly all of the equipment and supplies the workers used. In addition, planters often extended credit to the to the workers for their living expenses. Okay. Yeah, so sharecropping was a way that um, uh, you know freedmen. The, the the one problem, of course, you know, uh, you earned your freedom, but you know you don't own property. Uh, you haven't collected any wealth. Uh, you know, there's no way there, you know, it, it, it's difficult to get started. So uh, they were, you know, these, these former plantations, uh, and you had lots of, of land to farm. So the owners of that land would basically allow uh, these, these freed, freed men now to work the land and uh, they would, you know, share in the profits. Uh, but we'll see that becomes a bit of an issue too. Uh, Grace, would you like to read the second paragraph for us? At the end of the growing, the growing season, workers typically receive half of the proceeds from the sale of crops of the crops. However, planters usually deducted expenses, money workers owed, and interest from the workers' portion of the profits. These factors, as well as other dishonest practices by many planters prevented workers from making a living at sharecropping. Federal reforms intended to help formerly enslaved people did not have a lasting effect in the South. Both local and state governments reasserted themselves to maintain economic and social control over newly freed African Americans. All right. Yeah. So Here's their problem, right? Well, who owns that land still? Well, it's it's the white Southerners that you know prior to that had slaves. Uh, so there's animosity there. Uh, there's still the idea of you know white supremacy that they're going to you know maintain over that population. So you know, it, in in theory, the idea of sharecropping was you know may, maybe a good idea, but then you have these former former slave owners and and, and, and white people from the South that are basically still controlling that land. So, you know, they're putting on these additional taxes and service fees and, you know, you would, you would harvest a crop and then you would take it to sell and, you know, they're, they're giving your money. It's like, oh, well, you know, there's this fee and there's this tax and there's, you know, all this, and, you know, here's your $2 for the, you know, the, the crop. Um, so it was a way to continue to suppress uh, the, the recently freed men. Uh, and Grace, go ahead and read question three for us if you don't mind. Okay. In which of the following ways did the system of sharecropping differ from slavery in the South? A, workers on plantations were often mistreated. B, workers could receive payment for their work on plantation. C, planters provided the materials used to produce crops. And D, workers helped cultivate cash crops such as cotton. Um, B? Yeah, workers receive payment for their 
work on a plantation. Uh, you know, there was a problem with how much they were receiving, not necessarily always fair. And of course, you know, you're not, you're not bound to chattel slavery anymore. So uh, you could, you know, you could, you could leave. Uh, you didn't have to continue that job, you know, if something, a bit, you know, better came along uh, or you wanted to move to the north or what have you. So, um, and yeah, so B is a boy for three. And then number four, uh, Capri, would you like to read number four? In which of the following ways were the experiences of sharecroppers similar to those of enslaved people? Both received credit to cover the cost of their living expenses. Both traveled together with their families. Both had some control over the cultivation process. Both worked primarily at agricultural tasks. I think the answer is D. Yeah, so it was still agricultural tasks, right? Um, still farming, something that they were familiar with. At least they had those skill sets. So that was another reason sharecropping uh, what, you know, was, was an interesting idea because that was skill sets that uh, these previously enslaved you know, people had. Um, so the, you, you didn't need the necessary uh, retrain uh, or add additional skill sets to that. Um, so D as a dog for number four. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just a bit of text here. I'll go ahead and read this. Um, we're talking about the amendments now. So the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, and we have a couple sections of text from, from the uh, amendment. Section one says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section two, Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And then from the 15th Amendment, uh, section one says the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States, yeah, United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So same section two for both. Okay, uh, Christiana, could you read question five for us? Okay, the question says, in which of the following ways are these am amendments similar? A, both deal with the voting rights of United States citizens. B. <laughs> Both describe qualification needed to hold federal or state office offices. Both grant Congress the authority to enforce their provision. D. Both prohibited. Both prohibit slavery within the territory of the United States. I think it's the C. Yeah, C. And that pretty much goes yeah. for every amendment, right? They're not going to create an amendment and then not be able to enforce it. So that's something you could pretty much say for all uh, of the amendments. That's, that's going to be somewhere in one of the, in, in the writing there. So C for number five and number six. Uh, Etta, could you read number six for us? Okay. Which of the following is illegal? under the 15th amendment but is not addressed in the 13th amendment um, you can read <coughs> oh a poll takes for certain ethnic groups b the imprisonment of convicted criminals c voter registrations drives or D, involuntary servitude in United States territories. And they saying uh, which is not addressed in both. Right. And you could think about, you know, summarizing it as far as the, the amendment goes. So the 13th Amendment was about, was basically outlawing slavery. 
the 15th Amendment is about securing voter rights. So, um, C. A. So, what would be illegal, right? So, under the 15th Amendment, you couldn't, you know, uh, institute a poll tax, right? That's where people are going to show up. I think I mentioned that before, you know, the day you go to vote and they tell you, you know, there's a $10 fee or something to vote, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's the thing. Um, and it happened anyway. Uh, they, there was, there, you know, there was a lot of ways that the Southern states suppressed uh, uh, the Freedman vote after the 1870s uh, to keep them away from the, the polls. And they would, you know, you, you had to show literacy, you had to, you know, do this or that, or, you know, and it, it was, it was, you know, all kinds of creative ways to keep them away from, from voting. And I think we'll see some stuff about voting here in a second. So six is A. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have a table here. It's, it's talking about uh, legislators, uh, earlier African-American legislators. Uh, so this is after Reconstruction, 22 African-Americans from the South represented their states in Congress. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, however, Jim Crow laws began to influence the results of elections in the South. No African-Americans from any state served in the Senate between 1881 and 1967. Similarly, the House of Representatives had no African-American members between 1901 and 1929. Since then, however, Congress has continually had African-American members as of 2013, the House had uh, 139 African American members, and uh, the Senate, while the Senate has had eight. Uh, I remember, you know, the House of Representatives is a much larger uh, body. Uh, you know, it's it's based on population, basically. That's why we have the one of the reasons we have the census every few years to determine districts and you know how many representatives the state gets. Uh, some states like Montana have such little population that they basically have a token, you know, representative or two. Uh, same thing with the Senate, right? So here we have uh, in our in our table, we have the, the names in one column, the state that they represented in the next, and their accomplishment uh, in the other box. So for example, Hiram Revels is from Mississippi, the first African-American member of U.S. Senate elected by Mississippi State Legislature on February 23rd, 1870. Now you think about the date, right? 1870, that's still under Reconstruction. Around 1873 is when the era of Reconstruction ended. Uh, and then Blanche K. Bruce, Mississippi, first uh, African-American to serve a full term in U.S. Senate from 1875 to 1881, elected by Mississippi State Legislature, uh, last African-American senator until 1967. Uh, Joseph Hayne Rainey, South Carolina, first African-American popularly elected to Congress, a formerly enslaved person. He joined Congress in 1870 and served four more terms in the House. Gregory Henry White, North Carolina, the last <laughs> formerly enslaved person to serve in Congress and last African-American in the House until 1929. He served from 1897 to 1901. You'll also notice some of these were voted in by state legislature. So, uh, only I think Blanche K was it Blanche K Bruce or Joseph Hayne Rainey? Probably yeah, I think it was just Joseph Hayne Rainey where you know you actually had a popular vote where people went to the polls and voted for him. Uh, in the other cases, you, they were they were voted in by their state legislature into the House of Representatives and the the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Um, and let's see, uh, Tracy, would you like to read number four? Oh, I'm sorry, not number four, number seven. Number seven. Uh, we said the following describes the class a way in which the Senate and the House of Representatives were all similar. A, both, both experience a lengthy period in the 19, the 109, 1,900 with no African-American members. B, Hiram uh, Revels served 
in both houses of Congress. See, both houses of Congress had had at least one African American member since 1929. The Af African Americans were popularly elected to both houses of Con Congress in 1870. So, uh, in in one thousand and twenty, we don't know. Nineteen twenty. Oh, oh. Uh, D. <laughs> it's it's A. Oh, it's um, a? Yeah, the Hiram Rebels was only a uh, U.S. senator, um, but here, right, the one thing we we can we can look at, uh, we know that when we get to the 1900s, that both uh, the Senate and uh, House of Representatives uh, experienced lengthy periods, right, uh, by 19. Well, from 1929 to 1967, there was no African Americans in either the House or the U.S. Senate. So seven is A. Okay. So the the, the evidence of this answer in the last, unless I don't see the, the the evidence of the answer on the, on the table. Well, this is one. It's um. It's not in the table necessarily. Uh, it's you have to sort of look at the text um, and the table, and uh, it's it's a bit sort of making an assumption. But you can eliminate some of those. Uh, so if you looked at Hiram Rebels, uh, where it says served in both uh, House of you know it's this first American member of U.S. Senate elected by Mississippi State Legislature, so you can rule that one out. Uh, both houses of Congress had at least one African American member since 1929. We know that after 1929, there wasn't either. Yeah. Okay. So you just have to, you know, it, this is one of those where it's hard to, uh, you, you know, you'll have to sort of take a moment to review the information that's put there. I see. All right. So seven is a uh, eight. Uh, Grace, could you read eight for us? Okay. Based on the table and the information, which of the following describes a way in which the Senate and the House of Representatives have been different? Hey, the House of Representatives has have, have had far more African American members than did the, the Senate. B, the Senate has had far more African American members than did the House of representatives and C, African Americans have served in the House of Representatives throughout the entire 20th century. And D, African Americans have served in the Senate throughout the entire 20th century. Is it A? Yeah, A. House of Representatives had far more African-American members than to the Senate. Uh, you know, the, one of those reasons is you just, you have more representatives in the House than you do in the Senate. So the likelihood that you're also gonna have more African-American members is, is likely. Um, so eight is A. Okay, and nine, Christiana, could you read number nine for us? I'm okay. The question says, which of the following ways were the name? Is it Hiram? Hiram or Hiram Rebels. And Joseph Hiram Rani different. The A says the Hiram reveal, reveal was selected years later than Joseph Hiram Rain. Rain. Hain Rainey. Hain Rainey. B, Joseph Hain Rainey. 
served in the Senate and Henry reveal, reveals joined the House of Representatives. C, Henry reveals was formerly enslaved, but Joseph Henry was not. The name is confusing me. D, Joseph Henry Rain, Rainey was popularly selected, but Henry was not. Um, I think uh, is the uh, is it the A or the D? D, yeah, D is in dog. Uh, only one of those uh, members here was popularly elected, and that was. Which one was it? Uh, Joseph Hayne Rainey, right? He was the only one that was popularly elected. The rest were elected by their state legislature to, to go to the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. So nine is oh, D. Okay. D is in dog. Okay, yes. number 10, Capri. Would you like to take number 10 for us? <clears throat> Which of the following statements accurately compares or contrasts Jim Crow laws and the Fe Fugitive Slave Acts? Jim Crow laws, unlike the Fugitive Slave Acts, were not actual legislation. Both were established to prevent African Americans from serving in government. The Fugitive Slave Acts were federal laws, but Jim Crow laws were state or local acts. Both were enacted to preserve slavery in the South. And the answer is C. C. And you know, the weird one here, we, we don't really have any information about the Fugitive Slave Acts. So that's going to be a little bit of prior knowledge. We did talk about this briefly that the you know it used you used to have a federal law right uh, you, you know when you see act you can usually determine that that's a federal law uh, where the north if there was a a fugitive slave that had had left the south and was caught in the north that they would return that slave um, and that was the early 1800s. That eventually was repealed. The act was repealed. So if, if slaves actually came to the North, they, they wouldn't be returned. Um, but yeah, that was federal legislation. Jim Crow laws were, were state and local. Um, and you, know, you can kind of make that assumption because we know we're talking about the North and the South here. We're talking about Southern legislatures. So you can, you can make an assumption there and you can infer that Jim Crow laws would be a state or local act, okay? Um, so yeah, 10 is C as in cat. And 11, Etta, can I get you to read number 11? All right, and which of the following ways were the careers of Blanche K. Bruce and George Henry White the same? A, both served just one term, B, they were the last African Americans to serve in their respective branch of Congress for many years. C, both were properly elected to office, or D, they both represented the same state in Congress. Um, I think it is B. Yep, B is a boy. They were the last in either branch to serve for many, many years until 1967. So B is a boy for number 11. And <clears throat> we have uh, sort of like a text-based timeline. Remember we talked about timeline some and we usually have like a graphic that goes across the screen or something, but this is sort of the same idea. Um, I'll read through them real quick here. They're just little bullet points. So 1863, President Lincoln proposes plan for reconstruction. Still during the Civil War, right? We still got about two years left, but now he's thinking about what we're we gonna do at the end. 1864, Congress passes the Wade Davis bill, which requires 50% of state's male voters to take a loyalty oath. Uh, President Lincoln vetoes the bill. Uh, Lincoln is assassinated in 1865. Also in 1865, uh, Andrew Johnson issues amnesty proclamation designed to take control of reconstruction from Southern aristocracy. So they were the federal government was gonna step in at that point <clears throat> through an amnesty proclamation to start the reconstruction process. 
Also in 1865, the 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery, goes before the states on January 31st, 1865, and is ratified on December 6th, 1865. So it took almost a year, right? End of January of that year to the 1st of December of that year. But that's a whole process. And you consider that things move a little bit slower without you know, uh, a lot of modern technology. So uh, 1865, Congress denies seats to former Confederates. President Johnson criticizes Republicans and vetoes their reconstruction legislation. So here we're starting to see the tension between Johnson and radical Republicans. They were gonna, th that goes along with the, the loyalty, uh, um, you know, uh, basically loyalty oath that can we trust former Southerners uh, to serve again in you know, our, our legislative branches. Um, so that 1865 Congress denies seats to former Confederates. 1866, Congress passes the Civil Rights Act. 1866, again, the Fourth Amendment, which guarantees citizenship to all people born in the United States, including formerly enslaved people, is rejected by most Southern states. No surprise, right? There's still you know, a lot of friction there. Uh, 1867, Reconstruction Acts pass Congress and establish military districts to govern the South. So they were basically under military rule. You had uh, officers and soldiers uh, in the South that were taking care of that. 1868, Congress impeaches President Johnson but falls short of removing him from office. Remember we said just by one vote, he almost got removed from office because of the way he was handling Reconstruction. 1868, again, six Confederate states rejoined the Union. The 14th Amendment is ratified by the states. So we saw the 14th Amendment introduced in 1866, took a little longer down to 1868 to get it ratified, right? 1870, the remaining Confederate states rejoined the Union. 1870, again, the 15th Amendment is ratified, guaranteeing all citizens the right to vote, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. 1877, Reconstruction ends with the Compromise of 1877, uh, which declared Rutherford B. Hayes president after the results of the 1876 election were disputed. And our question 12, Tracy, could you read question 12, please? Yes. In which of the following ways did the 13th and 14th amendments Oh, differ wait. I think... 12 is, oh, yeah, 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 up above yeah. that. Andrew Johnson reconstruction policies were most similar to which of the following? A, the policies of the racial republicans. B, the policies of uh, rooster fraud behave. See the policies of Abraham Lincoln. D, the policy of the former Confederate. Um, Andrew. So, considering who Andrew Johnson was, right? Yes, Andrew Johnson. Oh, I think D. It's C. The C. policies that Abraham, right? Because he was he was Lincoln's vice president, and they were following sort of the same ideas there. But that's also what got him in trouble with the radical Republicans to some degree. Um, Grace, could you read number 13 for us, please? Okay. In which of the following ways did the 13th and the 14th Amendment differ? A, one dealt with reconstruction, while the other dealt with for, foreign policy. B, one was ratified within a year, while the other took about two years to ratify. Abraham Lincoln 
uttered one amendment while con congressional leaders wrote the other. And D, radical Republicans supported one amendment, but not the other. Is this C or D? It's B. B, okay. Yeah, that one's kind of <laughs> odd because you're thinking it's gonna be something about the content of the amendments or something like that, but it's basically just how long it took uh, was a yeah. difference. It was mentioned like 13th was just a little short of a year and it took almost two years for the 14th. All right, um, so 13 is B as a boy, Capri. Once you finish out number 14. Oh, no, we do have two more. Okay, sorry, 14. In which of the following actions? I'm sorry, wait. Hmm. One more minute. In which of the following actions did Andrew Johnson demonstrate a reconstruction strategy similar to that of the radical Republicans, vetoing the Reconstruction Acts, criticizing the decision to not seat former Confederates in Congress, arguing against the establishment of military districts in the South, taking control of the Reconstruction taking control of reconstruction away from the Southern aristocracies. Um, D. Yep, D is in dog, right? So taking that uh, away from um, the Southerners. Okay, 15, uh, Christiana, we'll finish out with 15 here. Okay. <laughs> And in which of the following ways were the 14 and 15 amendment similar? A, both grant, both guarantee the rights that African American had, had not previously had. Both were rejected by the North, Northern states. Both were quickly ratified. Both were supported by President Woodford. Woodford. Rutherford B. Hayes. A. Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, I think it's A. Yeah, right. They uh, both guaranteed rights um, that African Americans had not previously had. So yep. 15 is A. Um, any, uh, anybody miss anything there? I need to stop. That was the last one. Anybody need an answer for any of those 15? Much. 12 is C as in cat. Okay. Anybody else? I think we're are we good. One and two, one and two was, uh, one was A, two is B as in boy. Why? Okay. Let me go ahead and I'll stop recording here. You can, you can put them in the chat. I think that might be 